Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first uh, Chartered Cancer Research webinar. We're very pleased you could join us this evening. I'm Ashley. I'm the Chief Executive here at CCLG. Um, and it's my pleasure to be hosting this first session with you. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping for those of you that might be new to Zoom webinar. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. If you've got any questions that you would like to pose uh, to Cathy at the end of the talk, then please post them there and we'll, we'll go through those at the end of the session. Um, <coughs> we are uh, recording this session, so it will be available on our social media channels following uh, the presentation. And finally, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Cathy Pritchard-Jones. Cathy is a long-standing CCLG member and actually the winner of our Lifetime Achievement Award this year. Um, she's also the immediate past president of the International Society for Pediatric, on Pediatric Oncology and a world-renowned uh, Wilms Tumor expert. So I will hand over to Cathy. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ashley. Um, I'm just checking everyone can hear me okay. If not, Ashley, send me a message in the chat. I am deeply honoured to be asked to inaugurate what I think is a fantastic idea, a, a research, um, how to research series um, based around childhood cancer. And the primary aim of tonight's session is for um, parents and possibly some patients uh, to hear a bit more about how research happens, um, something about what we found, but most importantly for you to be able to have a discussion um, with me and amongst yourselves, I think that will be possible with the format, I'm not quite sure. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and uh, kick off, uh, share there. However many times you do it, it's always a bit tricky in the moment, right? So, so this is episode one of what is, I hope will be a stimulating research talk series that you will all return to. And I see that most people online are from uh, the UK, but I just noticed my colleague from uh, Brazil seems to be online. So welcome, Beatrice. So I was asked to address the question really of how does kidney cancer research work? And I thought I'd like to sort of take you on a journey, which will be a personal perspective, starting with why do children develop cancer, uh, going through to how can we improve outcomes? And the first thing is really identification of which children are particularly high risk of kidney cancer, and then subsequently, which treatments are best for any child with a kidney cancer, um, how to improve future treatments, and how can we um, improve outcomes? So I think it's really important, and maybe this slide summarizes every, all the messages from my talk. It's important to have a clearly defined uh, medical or clinical problem that needs answering. You definitely need a motivated workforce um, and they have to have an inquiring mind, a real desire and long term commitment to the, solve the problem. And of course, resources, uh, training, personal training, funding and support to have the time um, and support needed to do the research. I'm sure I probably don't need to tell this audience, but children's cancers are very different to adult cancers. Here you just have a pie chart, which shows on the right that nearly all adult cancers are in the category that we called carcinomas. And that includes renal cell carcinoma in adults, even though that's quite a, a low percentage of adult kidney cancer. Whereas in children's cancers, we see a big group of what are called embryonal tumours where the renal tumours lie, but also the vast majority of childhood cancers are formed of leukemias, lymphomas, brain tumours, the embryonal tumour category, and then um, a miscellany of other groups. So kidney cancers are about 8% of all childhood cancers, so quite a significant proportion. And here you see in adults, the big four are breast, bowel, lung, and prostate, but kidney cancers in adult cancers, about 4% of all cancers. So in fact, adult kidney cancers are also considered relatively rare. 
And, and being rare has important implications for how you conduct research. Now, most children with kidney cancer will present with a swollen tummy. Sometimes um, parents or grandparents or just someone giving a child a cuddle will notice the abdomen's very hard and actually feel a lump. Um, and in fact, adults with kidney cancer often present in this way and feel their own lump. And here on the right, you see a, a cross-sectional CT scan of a child showing the um, one kidney looks normal and the other is hugely expanded with this very abnormal looking tissue. Now I'm going to focus mainly on Wilms tumor because that's been my main uh, research focus, but some of the principles I'll go through, of course, apply to any cancer in any child and also to kidney cancers in, uh, in general. What this uh, graph shows you here, the red line at the top is the number of cases of Wilms tumor um, by age group, and they're single years of age along the bottom from zero up to the age of 19, um, and the frequency. So up to the age of about seven, nine out of 10 kidney cancers in children are a Wilms tumor. And at the bottom line here, you'll see some of the other subtypes, which are much, much rarer. Um, and the one that's starting to increase with age, the purple line, that's actually renal cell carcinoma. And you'll see at about the age of 13 uh, to 14, the relative probability of Wilms versus renal cell carcinoma crosses over. And this is based on epidemiological research. So cancer registries all over the world, counting the number of cases and being clear about what their histology is and documenting them in national cancer registries that can then share their data and allow publication of this sort of paper, which is hugely valuable um, for planning um, clinical diagnostic probabilities. For example, when you should think about biopsying a child with a kidney cancer, or could you start chemotherapy just because it's most likely to be Wilms tumor. And you'll notice here at the bottom in very young infants, this blue blob corresponds to an entity called rhabdoid tumor of kidney, which is very rare. Um, but is most common in very young children, often under the age of six months. So the burning question, which I think I started my career with, it stimulated my interest, is why do children develop cancer? And I've uh, shamelessly stolen this nice diagram from my colleague Sam Bajati at the Sanger Institute, with whom I collaborate now. But it just reminds you of the structure of, of what goes on in every cell in our body. We have DNA that is the genetic code packed into these things called chromosomes. And here's the double-stranded DNA. And it can be modified by a process called DNA methylation. Now, why am I telling you these details? It's because it's in understanding this has been very important in understanding how and why Wilms tumors develop. So DNA mutations may occur in the actual DNA strands themselves on one or both strands in order to cause a cancer. But the DNA methylation that you see there doesn't change the sequence, but it gives you an abnormal on-off switch for each gene. And that's called epigenetics. And I just want you to keep that in mind because it's important when we think about Wilms tumors and how they develop. So Wilms tumor has the alternative name nephroblastoma. It's a very typical example of the embryonal tumors of childhood. The cancer cells, as you can see here, look, these are the cancer cells on the right. And on the left, you've got a section of a normal um, embryonic kidney. And you can just see how closely the cell types in the Wilms tumor resemble normal development, but obviously it's quite disordered. So this leads one to the hypothesis that Wilms tumor genes must be involved in normal developmental processes, but the control systems have obviously gone wrong. So the hunt for the first Wilms tumor gene began in the 1980s. And I was one of those people with the fire in the belly that I think you have to have if you're really going to devote your career to solving um, a clinical uh, a problem. 
and I, I, I began my PhD studies before the first Wilms tumor gene had even been isolated. But we had a clue because there's a missing bit of chromosome in uh, of chromosome 11 in children with a syndrome that's called Wilms tumor aniridia genital urinary malformation and a range of developmental abnormalities or WAGA for short. And here you've got a little result in this black and white diagram of something from my PhD, which shows that when we did find this WT1 gene, we could show, and the white, the illuminescence here, it was exquisitely expressed in certain cell types in the developing kidney and in the gonad. So it was really tantalizing as to how this gene could be responsible both for developmental abnormalities of the kidney and gonad, but also will uh, increase risk of Wilms tumor itself. So this is Wagga syndrome. I won't um, labor the description, but children are born with a missing iris. And this is due to a bit of the PAC6 or the whole PAC6 gene being missing. But right next door is the gene called the WT1 gene. Um, and these children only have one copy left. And they have a much higher risk of Wilms tumor than the average child. Nearly um, up to one in two children with this uh, scenario will develop a Wilms tumor in their lifetime, usually at quite a young age. But did this help us understand Wilms tumor? Well, not immediately. Um, probably for the following decade, uh, a lot of work was done on WT1 function and trying to understand how often it causes Wilms tumour. But it's actually found in only about one in 10 of all children with Wilms tumour. And it's usually only damaged in the tumour and not in the child's normal cells. There's a range of syndromes that are called overgrowth syndromes, which have a slightly less uh, but still very increased risk of Wilms tumor of the order of about 10 to 15 percent and nearly all cases of Breck with Wiedemann syndrome associated with an increased risk of Wilms tumor are due to abnormalities in DNA methylation. So this so are we able to now answer the question is Wilms tumor heritable I think we're a long way down the road, but we still don't have a complete answer. And there are various categories of heritability, which I've given a slight traffic light -like system to here. So if you inherit a mutated gene from your parent, then clearly it is heritable. But this is a very, very small proportion of children with Wilms tumor. If the mutation first occurs in the developing embryo, then the answer is maybe, because it depends if it's in every cell in your body or if it is what's called heterozygous or mosaic. So only certain cells have got the mutation, in which case you cannot pass it on to the next generation. Then those children I mentioned who have this damaged on-off switch, the epigenetic mutation, nearly always that is not something you can pass on to your own children. And if you only find the gene mutation in the tumor, then it's not present in your germline and you will not be able to pass it on to the next generation. It also means you didn't inherit it from your parents and therefore your brothers and sisters are not at increased risk. So for Wilms tumor, these are the rough proportions that we know now. We know for sure that only about one to two percent of children with Wilms tumor have a family history. This problem of what we call mosaicism, um, so is there a mutation in the developing embryo? Um, it's an evolving number, but it's probably in the range of 10 to 15 percent. It may be higher. This on off switch, the epi mutation seems to be quite common, maybe a third, maybe even more. Um, but still, the vast majority of Wilms tumor children appear, children with Wilms tumor appear to have. Um, damage genes only in the tumor rather than in the rest of their body. So how do we know about the genetics? How was all this research done? Well, clinical trials and studies are really important, not only to answer a question about a particular type of treatment, but also to collect um, 
information about all the children being diagnosed across the country, how they came to medical attention, tumor size, histology, and to collect samples and data about the treatment they were given and what happened to them. So we have a very long history in the, in the UK um, through the Children's Cancer and Leukemia Group and its predecessor organizations of doing national clinical studies in Wilms tumor. The very first one started in the 1970s, in fact. Um, and these studies are organized at a national level and nearly all children um, and their parents will sign up to take part. And they consent then to have blood and tumor samples together with coded clinical healthcare data sent to a national coordinating center for analysis. But more and more now, and indeed since the year 2001, we have taken part in international studies organized through the SIOP Renal Tumor Study Group. And we not only uh, plan studies together, but we also share the data, interpret it in comparison between countries that adds a lot of learning and have the ability to share samples, which can be particularly valuable if um, conditions are very rare. So this is the very first clinical trial the UK entered into together with international partners. And it was called SIOP WT for Wilms Tumor 2001. And it was a randomized trial actually aiming to remove the use of a chemotherapy drug called doxorubicin for children with lower risk Wilms tumors to make treatments safer in the long term. Because although doxorubicin is a very excellent drug for killing cancer cells, it can have a risk of long-term damage on the heart, even if you use quite moderate doses. And I just want to emphasize the effort this study took. 28 countries, 261 hospitals, and over 4,500 patients were registered. Only a subgroup were eligible for this randomized treatment reduction question. And this is what we call a survival curve. So you can probably see on the right, there's no difference between the two lines. And that is the likelihood that a child is alive or dead at five years from their treatment. And you can see here, it's a very high proportion are still absolutely fine over its 96% there. But on the left-hand side, this is the chance of, of being alive at five years without any problem having happened in the meantime, usually relapse. So here, the chance is a little bit lower but they're still uh, about 90%. And you'll see there's a small gap difference between the black line, which is the children that had all three drugs, and the red line where the children avoided the doxorubicin. So what we'd like to do is understand if we can appreciate the genetic changes in the tumor and use that to better predict which child needs which treatment. And since that trial was designed, so in the last 20 years, and in fact, most of this knowledge has come just in the last eight years, more than 50 genes identified in childhood kidney cancer, mostly in Wilms tumors, have been identified. And I won't bore you with the details, but there's lots and lots of different types here. They have lots of different mechanisms of action. And mostly they have not yet been able to be translated into a direct a therapy specific to a particular gene. So Wilms tumor is a bit different in the rate of progress compared to what you probably read about in the papers about childhood leukemias and other types of adult cancer where a single drug and a single gene can have a sort of match made in heaven and really work. We're not at that point yet with Wilms tumor. Maybe we will be one day. So what are we trying to do to accelerate that progress? So this is work in progress uh, called the Little Princess Trust Knowledge Bank of Wilms Tumor. And it's co-directed between um, myself and Dr. Tanzina Chowdhury at Great Ormond Street and UCL and uh, uh, Dr. Sam Bajati at the Sanger Center. And the aim here is to take frozen tumor samples, medical data, uh, subject the tumor samples to genomic sequencing, and we're aiming to have sequenced by the end of this year, or have them in the pipeline, over a thousand tumors, which will have sequencing of their genes, the gene expression, which is what's called mRNA, and methylation um, assessment of that epigenetic change. 
And it's going to go into what for me is a black box, but the idea is that this knowledge bank will be constructed based on linking up with the clinical data so that we can use the genetics to predict the outcome of individual patients in the future according to their tumor biology and treatment. So prognostic factors can improve selection of treatment for the individual child, but they can also provide insights to develop new treatments. And that requires a lot of international collaboration um, and because more and more children with Wilms tumour are being cured with the current treatment, so very few are looking or, or in need of new therapies at the moment. The other area of research that's been um, enabled by working together at an international level is to be able to look at non-invasive um, tests for, for both diagnosis and following response and even follow up for relapse. So this is not yet used clinically, but we are assessing it in the current study where children have a blood samples taken at diagnosis and during treatment. And we're able to uh, assess the circulating tumor DNA in that blood sample, the so-called liquid biopsy. Um, and what we know is that that can reflect, even if the tumor itself has got multiple changes in different parts, they can all come together in the blood sample. So a single test can replace the need to look at de several different parts of the tumor. And future clinical trials will definitely be based on biomarkers in, in, in the tumor and potentially in the blood to enable us to uh, select the best treatment regimen for each child. And we are taking part now in what's called the umbrella study of the Psyop Renal Tumor Study Group, which includes recommendations for all the different subtypes of um, scenarios of Wilms tumors and also recommendations for the non-Wilms tumors associated with ongoing sample collection, um, clinical data collection and outcomes reporting. And this is really important, particularly for these rare groups and the rare smaller subgroups of Wilms tumor uh, so that we can optimize, continue to optimize treatment and learn more about them. Now, one great insight that's already come from this work we're doing with Sam Bajati at the Sanger Center is that actually children, the so-called normal kidney in many children with Wilms tumor is not normal. And he's been able to show through um, sequence analysis of individual bits of the tumor that, of the kidney that comes out with the tumor that there's already evidence for an expansion of slightly abnormal cells in the normal kidney these blue cells they've got this epigenetic abnormality and then they can go on to either form a Wilms tumor or this precursor lesion called an nephrogenic rest or both and that also then leads to the potential. What if we could look back to see if very early signs of increased risk of Wilms tumor are detectable at birth? And this is theoretically impossible because all children have a so-called Guthrie card or neonatal blood test. And whilst we are not yet doing this research in the UK, I can tell you that in the International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon, they are doing a study based on Guthrie cards and childhood cancers more generally to see if it's possible to detect these changes from solid tumors in the, in the Guthrie cards. But if this were to be possible, um, of course, it would raise important questions which families would have to be involved in um, deciding about whether it would be then reasonable to put children who may have a fairly low risk of developing a Wilms tumor onto some form of surveillance. So my final point really is the huge importance of involving parents, survivors of childhood cancer, um, and other interested advocates, I think, in planning and designing and conducting the research. And I'm very grateful to Angela Polanco, who heads up the Wilms Tumor Link Group, which has enabled us to have more than a decade now of active interactions with um, families uh, with Wilms Tumor, not only in the UK, but in fact, wider around the world. And we continue to strengthen our links with the European and further afield parent and patient uh, communities. And this is important because we need to work together 
on understanding variation in outcomes by country. And the fact that the UK was able to take part as a national group in that PSYOP 2001 study I told you about has enabled us to recognise we have a problem with late diagnosis. So this is a kind of bar chart. The waste on these columns is the average size of a tumour at diagnosis. And the one in the middle, where it's a bit bigger than everybody else, is the UK. Um, so this is not good news for us. It means we've got somewhat later diagnosis of childhood cancer, of, of renal tumours in the UK. And yet we know when we've asked, um, looked back at hospital records to say, you know, what led to a child coming to medical attention was a delay, that in general, the moment a parent notices there's a lump in the tummy, um, the child's in the nearest paediatric hospital within 24 hours. So for most children, the pathway seems to work. And we believe the difference comes that there's less routine or incidental detection of uh, kidney cancer in the UK compared to some of these other countries like Germany, France, um, rest of Europe and Scandinavia, where they have a more pediatric led uh, primary care interface for children. But that's a hypothesis still to be tested. And we are now looking at it in the umbrella study and collecting data in a standardized format between countries about how children come to medical attention when they've got a kidney cancer. So we'll have some really important information from that study in the next um, one to two years, I think. But of course, it's all very well having information, but what do you do about it? So I'm very pleased to share with you, and you, many will be aware that we, there are national initiatives underway in the UK to improve early recognition and referral of childhood cancer. The first of these was initiated by Grace Kelly, um, Lady Bird Trust, so Jen Kelly, the mother of Grace Kelly, who actually had a rhabdoid tumour, um, and she herself is a G, and she's worked very hard to improve information for GPs and healthcare professionals and families about early recognition of childhood cancer. But now the CCLG is also funding a study called Child Cancer Smart, which is looking at the route to diagnosis for all children with cancer in the UK coming through the treatment centres. And again, those data will be available, I hope, in the next year. So finally, so we've got time for a discussion. Just want to acknowledge all those members of my research group over many years. Um, Sam Bajati at the Sanger Centre, Tanzina Chowdhury, consultant at Great Ormond Street. I haven't got pictures of everybody else. I know Kat Duncan's online, who also works in renal tumours at GOS and, and leads our interaction with the PSYOP post-genome uh, working group. And one of the stories for success, of course, in uh, research is to ensure that people that have worked with you, and here is Taryn Traeger, who's now doing her PhD with Sam. So again, I think it's turning the circle, keeping the, um, getting the interest of young people early on in a particular tumor type, asking them to develop their careers, develop their own expertise, and most importantly, contribute a huge amount of new knowledge and solutions to the future. And of course, none of this would be possible without research funding, which allows the clinicians and scientists to have dedicated time, and also to enable collaboration, sample collection, uh, and the actual uh, laboratory analyses. And you can see here at the bottom how the research I've been able to lead at UCL started out with a European FP7 grant, some support from Cancer Research UK, a lot of support from the Great Ormond Street Children's Charity. And then in the last several years, we're enormously thankful to the uh, Little Princess Trust and their partnership with the Children's Cancer and Leukemia Group, and also Angela Polanco's uh, charity Bethany's Wish for continued support. And I'd like to stop there if that's okay and take any questions. Thanks, Kathy. That was uh, really interesting. Um, I learn something new every time I listen to talks like this. Um, so if you've got a question that you'd like to ask Kathy, if you open the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom and type your question in there, or indeed in the chat, we'll put some of those uh, to Kathy now. Um, <clears throat> I'll start off, Kathy, with you talked about these embryonal precursors and also earlier about uh, potential predisposition genes. And do you think that as we understand more about 
what leads to Wilms tumour developing in the first place as an opportunity to prevent it from happening? Well, I think that's the holy grail. You know, we'd all love to do ourselves out of a job, <laughs> as I'm sure the families on the call would like to think their child with cancer. I think it'll be a good time yet to be in that situation. You know, most of the genetic knowledge is helping us understand who to pick out for surveillance um, and who perhaps needs more intensive follow up. And then the genetic changes in the tumours themselves is about improving treatment uh, choices and, and new drugs. But I think prevention, I think it's on the cards, but it's another whole area of research. Uh, there's a very interesting question in the Q&A, number one from Eleanor, uh, saying that she herself had had a, a prenatal test, the, the test for Down syndrome <laughs> was positive, but of course your daughter did not have Down syndrome, um, but she ended up having a Wilms tumour age six. So I would say, Eleanor, the answer to your question is that I don't think anyone's looked at that, um, but that would be an important thing to do. And what I don't know is how we would link the results of people's antenatal triple test with whether or not their child had cancer. That would certainly require quite a bit of navigation of data access and sharing at a national level to test that question. Um, it is an interesting one. Shall I carry on with the other questions in the Q&A? Um, okay. So Terry uh, Ray is saying that her son presented at the age of one with a seven centimeter tumor. Uh, he didn't present with a swollen stomach. Is there a reason for this? Uh, well, first of all, Terry to say the kidney sits really far back in the abdomen. It's right against the back of the abdominal wall in a place called the retroperitoneum. So even though your son was only one and his tumor was seven centimeters, it may have just grown in a certain way that it didn't make you know distend his abdomen so i think that's just a sort of anatomical one um then there's a question about the new childhood cancer research priorities which i did just read last week and thank you ashley and cclg for supporting that um childhood cancer partnership uh, priority setting i think we will all take it on board i mean i i do believe I did consider making a slide showing how we already meet, uh, quite addressing quite a lot of those priorities, but I thought that was maybe it wouldn't be time for that. But you're right. I think all researchers should be encouraged to look at that list. And in fact, the way to do ensure that they do is to ask all research funders to make it a requirement in your grant application that you show how your research proposal is going to help with addressing the right priorities that matter to families. Um, okay, and, and new ideas and avenues. Uh, I think uh, there's lots of new ideas and avenues. And, and for example, we just had one proposed by Eleanor, you know, could the triple test for Down syndrome results have any impact on uh, childhood cancer risk? That's an interesting one. Yeah, I, th I think we're really hopeful that those priorities will open up some new avenues. But to take your point about funders, part of the 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 wrapping up of that project, we are going to have a, an event for research funders early next year to, to raise awareness of the priorities and, and encourage people to really focus on those. Um, another question for you uh, from the chat this time, Kathy. Um, so my son was recently diagnosed uh, with Wilms tumour, and it's just gone off my screen, I'm scrolling back up. Um, do you, oh, I've got it here, about CAR T cells, yeah. In the future. So immunotherapy in childhood solid tumours is already showing that it's, it's much more selective than in leukaemias. So there's a general point that immunotherapies in adult cancer seem to work best in tumour types where there's many hundreds, if not thousands of mutations. And in childhood cancer, usually what's called the mutational burden, so the number of mutations per length of genome is much much lower than in adult cancer and immunotherapy seems to be less successful i think it is well it car t cells are being tried at the moment in um, some of the very high risk childhood solid tumors particularly brain tumors and neuroblastoma 
I think there is the potential to look at immunotherapy targeted against the WT1 protein, because that is quite specifically uh, expressed in many wounds tumors. And the experience in adult blood cancers is that giving anti-WT1 immunotherapy does not affect your bone marrow. So that is an avenue that we have thought about, but we haven't yet been able to design a study that would fit um, you know, identifying which group might benefit. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, a question from Neil next about how much of the, the science and knowledge in Wilms tumour that you've talked about today would be common and applicable across other childhood cancers? So Wilms tumour was responsible for the uh, sort of proving the two hit hypothesis that you know susceptibility to a cancer can be inherited but that you don't get the cancer until the second copy of the same gene is damaged in the kidney cell or other cell itself so that model has been applied right across childhood cancer and adult cancer um, i think the early diagnosis problem that i've pointed out to you is also common across other childhood cancers and then some of the actual genes, some of them are very specific to Wilms tumour, or, or they may be found in one or two other different rare types of childhood cancer. So like mutations in genes that affect something called microRNA processing have been found in Wilms tumour. They are found in a few other rare types of childhood cancer. Um, so we should be working together with those other groups when it comes to trying to develop new targeted therapies specifically for those mutations. Uh, and I can assure you that that would happen, uh, particularly with initiatives in Europe, and in fact, globally now with something called Accelerate, the idea being to stimulate the pharmaceutical industry to use mechanism of action rather than the type of a tumour to decide who, um, how to apply clinically a new therapy. Um, I've now got a few more questions. Um, so Jeanette Hawkins' question or comment, really, the answer is yes, it is correct, Jeanette. In simple terms, most kidney cancers in children seem to be something going wrong spontaneously in the genes in the child's kidney as part of normal growth. Um, and mostly we still don't know what makes these spontaneous errors occur. I think I would have to largely agree with you there. I think in the last couple of years, we've really had more insight that the epigenetic methylation abnormality is actually much commoner than we thought and is also occurring very early. So that is a potential target for intervention, uh, but we're not at clinical uh, time studies yet. Um, then the second question from Eleanor um, I'm just reading it because it's quite a long question. Um, it's really about, um, you know, how rapidly a general practitioner would decide uh, or agree that a test is needed on a child who's got some symptoms, maybe which are not immediately making them think of cancer. Um, and you yourself, you say, had a history of uh, renal angiomyolipoma, which is something completely different to Wilms tumour. Um, so I think it probably is a coincidence, uh, but you said you had them bilaterally. So I'm going to uh, maybe suggest I might come back to you on that. I don't think I can answer that question immediately other than to say that, you know, I think it is important that general practitioners are supported uh, to know when to recognize uh, children with cancer uh, children should be referred for further testing and to make that easier for them um, it is a problem in britain at the minute i think we're short of gps we're also quite short of pediatricians uh, but i think the child cancer smart study that's going on at the moment will have a big impact there and then Gemma, you've you've made a, a comment about your daughter being um having uh sorry things moved around <laughs> that her she had a bigger foot on one side than the other um but well i would suggest if she has got any sign of body asymmetry 
that it would be worth asking if they could do the methylation test. Uh, but that would be done through the clinical genetics of your daughter's hospital. So if anyone thinks uh, that a genetic test should be done for clinical purposes, it's very important that your oncologist uh, links up with their local clinical genetics service. But these days, the, the NHS is actually paying for a molecular analysis of childhood cancer. Um, but in your ch particular case, if there's any sign of body asymmetry, I think you wouldn't have any difficulty persuading them that this test should be done, the methylation test. I've now got a, um, a question asked, how many projects am I involved in at any one time? Um, the answer is probably too many, but I think it's important to enable and encourage uh, colleagues in the team to be able to set up their own collaborations and networks. So uh, probably I'm involved with too many because I've been in the field for too long, uh, but I do try to focus and, and more and more now moving away from the clinical um, trials, which are led by my colleagues at Great Ormond Street and focusing on how we can make better use of the data we've already got and the samples to enhance knowledge um, because I think you know data may be collected once for a specific research purpose but it can have huge value if you can use it in other studies and particularly for international comparisons okay then someone's all also asking about how can you stay up to date with uh, research on Wilms and how can I get involved well, could I urge you to contact, um, you can sign up to Angela Polanco's uh, Wilms uh, link group, which has a Facebook page. Um, and Ashley, I think you could provide that to, to them, couldn't you? Or could yeah, somebody put definitely. in the link? I don't have it to hand. We've got that information out to everyone that's signed up. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then there's a question about someone who, Katie, I, I guess your child, is actually in one of the current studies and you very kindly consented her uh, for her to have her samples taken. So yes, you're right. Um, blood tests taken as part of a study, we've always made it clear that if we were to find something of known clinical relevance now, then we would feed it back to your doctors, your child's oncology team and ask them to take it up with your local genetics. Um, there are many genetic changes that are found that are still not certain we're not certain what they mean so we wouldn't be feeding back all of those until we actually know what they mean um but again to emphasize for the majority of children still um we don't find anything that explains why they've had their wombs tumors right and then there's one from Haley, um which is uh I think your daughter must have had some evidence of these precursor lesions called nephrogenic rest, which means our current protocol recommends um, continuing the therapy for 12 months. Um, so I think the genetic test you would have been done would have been to look for these methylation changes and other things. And I would recommend you ask your oncologist specifically if they could give you feedback. Uh, because without that, I can't really comment on the clinical situation. Sorry. So, Kathy, just picking up a question from Louise in the chat. Um, it sounds it sounds like it um, took a while uh, for her child to be diagnosed. Um, she asks, would blood test and prior to diagnosis for some of the symptoms that that she now recognises were potential cancer symptoms? Have shown anything was off before the tumour was found on a scan? I think with Wilms tumour, usually even when you've got a big tumour in your tummy, your blood tests are normal. Um, so it's not a cancer type that, um, that affects a sort of routine blood test. You'd have to be looking to measure something like circulating tumour DNA, which is not actually a, a test that's offered at the moment. Um, in the NHS and is very specialised, it wouldn't be done as a routine. Um, I think it's more about being astute, referring patients for an ultrasound scan at an early, that's the most useful test to pick up an early Wilms tumour rather than a blood test. Thanks, Kathy. Um, <laughs> so we are coming to the end of, of our time. I just want to thank you again, for Kathy, for joining us. Uh, for your interesting talk and for answering everyone's 
questions this evening. Uh, for those of you that are um, attending, you will not be surprised to hear that you'll be receiving an email from us asking for some feedback. Um, and that's just to help us plan the future of these talks so that we can carry on putting talks that are relevant uh, to you as, as parents and about topics that you want to listen to. Um, we'll be advertising the episode two of this series shortly. So if you're following us on social media or if when you register for this webinar, you let us know you'd like to find out about future talks, you'll find out when those are happening. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us and have a good evening. Thank you very much for coming.